I want to summon your senses and invite your intellect to the gospel that has been recorded by John chapter number 6. John chapter number 6. And if you don't have a Bible, the scriptures will be seen on the screen for your viewing. We want to begin reading at verse number 66. John chapter 6, verse 66. Your Bible should read, From that time many of his disciples went back and walked no more with him. Then said Jesus unto the twelve, Will you also go away? Then Simon Peter answered him, Lord, to whom shall we go? You have the words of eternal life, and we believe and are sure that you are that Christ, the Son of the living God. Jesus answered them, Have not I chosen you twelve, and one of you is a devil? He spoke of Judas Iscariot, the son of Simon, for he it was that should betray him, being one of the twelve. I want to tag this text, Why Did You Pick a Devil? You may be seated in the Lord's church. Most scholars agree that the Gospel of John, though it is classified as a member of the Gospel Quartet, is not a synoptic Gospel. Because when we read the Gospel of John, it has accounts, moments, stories, events, miracles recorded in it that are not recorded in Matthew, Mark, and Luke. Matthew, Mark, and Luke are synoptic in that they cover the same stories from a different angle. These gospel writers, from one aspect, can be identified as biographers writing about the life of Jesus Christ. From another aspect, they can be identified as news reporters who are covering the same story from a different angle. John is different. And John is different because his theological thesis for his book is different. He pushes the envelope that Jesus Christ was not just the son of God, not just the Messiah, but that he was God. And to approach Christ from that perspective does not permit for you to uh, cover him like everybody else. And thus John has his own unique set of events and moments in the life of Christ that are specifically designed to purport and support his thesis that Jesus was God. John 1 and 1, in the beginning was the word, the word was with God, and the word was God. The rest of the book is about that one verse. And thus, he uses events. The Greek text specifically calls them signs that point to the deity of Jesus Christ. Signs, ladies and gentlemen, aren't actually where we need to go. They point us to where we need to go. They shift us, then shift our focus in a certain direction. As a matter of fact, the only miracle that is recorded in all four Gospels is recorded here in John chapter 6, the feeding of the 5,000. That's the only miracle that all four writers cover together. And in John chapter 6, it's John's version of that 
event, which for the most part may be the most detailed and most insightful account of that moment where Jesus took two fish and five loaves of bread and fed 5,000 men, not counting the women and children. Historians would tell us that it may have been possibly about 20,000 people out there. If you were just counting the men without the women and children. And John records this account, but John pushes the envelope past the other three writers because John says that the miracle itself was not Jesus point. The miracle was a sign pointing to a larger truth that not only could Jesus turn a desert into a delicatessen but he could also showcase a miracle that pointed to a larger message that he himself was the bread of life. And so John records a series of miracles that precede a discourse or a sermon or an exegesis on the being of Christ. That I am feeding the masses because I am the bread of life. And thus... He begins this discourse about his own being that the miracle was only an illustration for a larger sermon. And the larger sermon was, I am the bread of life. I just can't tell you that because you walk by sight and not by faith. So I have to show you that I'm the bread of life and then point and show you that what I was showing you, I was always giving you an illustration of myself. I was that manna that fell from heaven that fed the children of Israel in the wilderness. I am this bread in the midst of this New Testament version of this wilderness event that's feeding 20,000 people. I am who God sent down to give nourishment and strength and life to the people of God. And he begins to give further exposition on his illustration in verses 63 and 64, where he tells the people that if you eat my flesh and drink my blood, I will be in you and you will be in me. Unfortunately, ladies and gentlemen, the people interpreted his claim as cannibalism. And they were troubled, and the Bible says that they were even offended by such a troubling statement. Jesus responds in verse 65 and 66 and tells them, if you're offended, you're offended because you interpreted my statement literally and not spiritually. For the words that I speak, they are spirit and they are life. I am talking spiritually and you only saw it literally. And they still didn't get it, so they were offended because they did not want to participate in what they perceived to be cannibalism. And verse 66, where you and I picked it up, says from that time forward, many of his disciples defected from the faith. Catch that church. Thousands of people whom had just been fed and benefited by a miracle left Jesus. Catch it, y'all. They were there for the miracle, but didn't want the message. You see, ladies and gentlemen, a show will always attract a crowd. 
But when we get down to the meat of the matter and to the message, most people don't want the meat. They just want the show. And there, there is a, there, that's where the rubber meets the road, y'all, because when the message now becomes the forefront and it requires some prayer and some interpretation by the spirit and some calls of mental activity, now people are repelled. There, you, you, you and I, ladies and gentlemen, see it all day long, even now. And we've got to be careful that we don't continue to entertain just to bring a crowd. Because at the end of the day, it is not the entertainment that is going to sustain you in the middle of the night. It is not the show that is going to keep you when you're in the hospital and when you're facing challenges in your life. It has got to be the word of the Lord. The grass withers and the flowers fade but the word of the Lord shall stand forever and when you get done with lights, camera, action, smoke guns and all of that foolishness people will come for the show but only those who are serious will stay for the message Jesus has just experienced his first defection because we find out that the defection was a group of disbelievers anyway. And let me upset you. Did y'all notice that Jesus didn't chase who left? As a matter of fact, as a matter of fact, Jesus was so disinterested in them leaving, he turns to the 12 and says, y'all leaving too? <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, let me be very clear to say to you, and it may make you uncomfortable. I'm never worried about who leaves. I'm only worried about who's left. Because there are some people who need to leave. Because disbelief is a cancer that can affect the others who are around. So if you already in disbelief, you need to be in a place where you are not being contagious. I'll probably get some writing about that one. I'll get some emails or something about that. Jesus let them leave. And then turns to the 12 and says, are you leaving too? Peter speaks up on behalf of the apostolic band, the self-appointed representative. And says, Jesus, let me give you a corporate and conclusive no. We are not going anywhere. For two reasons. Number one, you have the words of life. And number two, we are sure that you are the Christ. The son of the living God. Y'all miss what he said. He said we are not leaving, number one, because we believe what you say because we know who you are. I'm going to try it one more time. You missed it. He said we're not going anywhere because we believe what you say because we know who you are. You have the words of eternal life. And you are the Christ, the son of the living God. And in Jesus' classic, unsuspecting way, he does not respond to this commendation with appreciation. He responds by shedding light on a secret at a strange time. 
Peter says, we're not going anywhere. Jesus says, well, first of all, the reason why you're not going anywhere and the reason why you choose me, because I chose you first. He says, haven't I not chosen you 12? Your ability to choose me is based on the fact I chose you. And one of you is a devil. They're in the midst of complimenting Jesus, affirming his identity, confirming his word. And at the time when they are affirming him, he is calling out a devil in a disciple. Seems like a weird time to bring this subject matter up. We just told you we stand with you. We just told you we're sure of who you are. And you want to bring this up now? He says, haven't I chosen 12? I want to pitch my tent at verse 70. I believe the question for us Shed some light on what is happening with the disciples in relationship to what may be happening in your life and mine in this season. Here is, Reverend Hudson, the problem with Jesus' disclosure. He says, haven't I not chosen you 12 and one of you is a devil. When you do your homework on this question, both Matthew, Mark, and Luke record the first time Jesus called these 12. Matthew 10, Mark 6, and Luke 9 all record when Jesus called the 12 the first time. And if you read those three chapters, you will find out that the first thing Jesus did after calling these 12 men is give them power to cast out devils. Matthew 10 and 1 says it. Mark 6 and 7 says it. Luke 9 and 1 says it. And when he called the 12, he gave them power to cast out devils and authority over unclean spirits. And the first thing Jesus does is call out a disciple with a devil who he gave power to cast out. He is trying to teach us, church, that defeat is going to happen in your life if you got the power to call out of other people what you won't check in yourself. I've given you power to cast out a devil and one of y'all got the very thing that I've already given you a solution for before you ever had the problem. You want to lay hands on everybody else. You want to cast out demons in everybody else. You want to check everybody else's sin, but you don't want to take the medicine that you apply to everybody else. I gave you the power first. And the very power I gave you as medicine for other people, you won't even take it for yourself. God deliver us. God deliver us from people who use their Christianity to make themselves self-appointed judges.
You can always check some other sister, but can't check yourself. You can always check some other brother about what they've done, but the only difference between them and you is that theirs is known and yours ain't known yet. Tell somebody, I ain't got time to be in your life. I need to handle the demons that's in my own life. I ain't got time to be judging you and putting you in hell. I got hell to deal with in my own life. Be careful how you judge other people. With the same measure you measure to other people, it shall be measured. Help me preach it, somebody. Under you. I didn't give you the anointing so you can make yourself God over, over other people. I gave you the anointing so you can keep your own life in check first. The very thing that Jesus gave them power over is the very thing one of them struggling with. Take another look at verse 70. Listen to what Jesus said, church. Have not I chosen you 12 and one of you is a devil? I'm going to try it one more time, Kara Watson. Have not I chosen you 12 and one of you is a devil? Okay. The language of verse 70 suggests Lenin that the choosing is in the past tense and the devil is in the present tense. I thought y'all could read in this church. Haven't I not chosen you 12 and one of you is? I'm going to try it one more time for these people right along here. Haven't I not chosen, past tense, and one of you is? The language of the text suggests, reigns, that Judas may not have been satanic when God called him. But somewhere between being called and dying, he took on the spirit of Satan. Which means, y'all, that Judas was not an elected devil, he was an eventual devil. He started off looking promising. He started off with everything right and good and somewhere down the line, Satan invaded his spirit. Pastor, what does that have to do with it? It has everything to do with it because now we have to question if that's the case, when did Satan decide to deal with Judas? I want to submit church. Satan never shows up until you're on the verge of advancement. I'll shout myself because you don't want to get happy. History proves, I don't know whose point this is for, but this might be the real reason why I'm preaching this sermon today. All of your advancements are preceded by attacks. Therefore, if you're under attack, you might be close to your next advancement. Okay. All right. Uh, Genesis chapter 8. Noah and his family have to survive the flood. Everything is dying. And uh, they're the only ones left. Lord instructs him to build this ark. 
They get in the ark, the Lord shuts the ark up. They're on the ark for 110 days, almost a year actually, a year and 10 days. When the, when the storm stops, they land on Mount Everest. They're in the storm. When the storm stops, they land on Mount Ararat. They've been in a storm for a year and a half. When the storm stops, they land on a mountain. They've been in a storm for a year and a half. When the storm stops, they're higher than they was before the storm stopped. The attack brought an advancement. Genesis chapter 26 uh, Isaac is trying to find his land to settle and every time he gets into a good place he strikes gold with some whales but the herdsmen attack him and they keep move, having to force him to relocate until he finally relocates to a place called Rehoboth and Rehoboth means the Lord has made room for me every time they attacked him they were actually advancing him to where God would have him to be Genesis chapter 37 through 49, 41 is the personality of Joseph who all in a matter of four chapters has been cast into a pit, sold into slavery. He's been, he's been falsely accused of rape charges and thrown in jail. But by the time he comes out of jail in Genesis 41 and 41, the Bible says because he interpreted Pharaoh's dreams, he gets called into the office of the hierarchy of Egypt and now he's number two in charge over all of Egypt. He got attacked before it started, but when the attack ended, he was in an advancement. David is in 1 Samuel chapter 16. He is in his daddy's pasture. He only knows manure and sheep. But because of Goliath and Saul, by the time he got done fighting them, he was in the office as God's first king. Because where there is an attack, there is an advancement coming. Job lost all that he had. His children had died. His body had been afflicted by boils. But by the time we get to chapter 42, the Bible says, and God gave Job double more than what he already had. Because where there is an attack, there is an advancement. Talk to somebody and tell them, neighbor, if you're under attack, it could be you're on the verge of an advancement. I'm trying to suggest to you that Satan only shows up when you're close to something great. <laughs> but here's the trick. Satan is not interested in who hosts him. Satan is interested in who his host can get to. Satan never wanted Judas. Satan wanted Jesus. But Judas was the close enough candidate to get to Jesus. Ladies and gentlemen, the devil is never going to attack you from a distance. He is coming through somebody who's got close proximity to you. Here is my question. Who is hosting your hell? It's not somebody you don't know. It's somebody you walk with. It's somebody you talk to. It's somebody you sleep with. It's somebody you work with. It's somebody in your family who's close enough to get to you. It's somebody close to you that is the host of your own hell. And he not going to show up till you on the verge 
of something great. See, y'all don't know when to get happy. I swear to God, man. We're going to put some shout buttons on. They're going to hang from the ceiling or something. Going to flash them on the screen or something. That means, ladies and gentlemen, you can shout when you're under attack. Because it's a sign that something great is on the other side of this matter. And if you can endure to the end and just get to the other side, He shows up because Jesus is on the verge of something that is great and irreversible. Take another look at verse 70. Would y'all notice That John's gospel, like the other three gospels, was written 30 to 40 years after the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. So in verse 71, it was the writer who discloses that, he, that Jesus was referring to Judas from verse 70. Because when Jesus asked the question to the disciples, they didn't know it was Judas. The writer revealed that it was Judas years later when the book was written. So the disciples really didn't know who the devil was in real time. Verse 70 was real time. Verse 71 was the writer's commentary because John was there so he could document who it really was after the fact. So Jesus is raising the question to the disciples when they really don't know to teach them a lesson about the movement and the activity of Satan. That one of the greatest strategies of Satan is his ability to hide in holy circles. He fed this devil. He called this devil. He made him the treasury over the account of the disciples. He let this devil see miracles. And nobody ever knew that it was a devil because the devil masters in being a disciple decoy. And he can hide in holy circles. And the only way to call him out is you got to have God in you. Lord have mercy today. Okay, y'all still acting funny. Let me come and get in your business and I'll leave you alone. At some of y'all houses, don't act brand new. You have seen a roach. No, 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 no. With your little, with your little dress clothes, don't get bougie now. Because some of y'all might have killed one on the way to, to the church today. Don't play me like you don't know what a roach is. At the crib, Mike, when you see one roach, that's a problem. But when you see more than one, that's a disaster. Because if you see one, you'll go get a bottle of Raid and just kill that one. But when you see several, raid can only address what can be seen. Yeah. 
But when you see more than one, it means that there is an infestation somewhere that you can't see. So you got to go call somebody who got more equipment and got more power that can get in the places where you can't see. Y'all acting funny, so I'll shout myself. Ladies and gentlemen, who are the roaches in your life who are eating away at your house? The only way to stop them is you got to call them out and find somebody that can go into invisible places. Because his strategy is stealth, sneaky, and silent one of y'all is a devil silent sneaky and stealth why did you pick him Lord you picked this guy what you pick him for I picked them so I can control them. <laughs> if Judas got a devil and I picked Judas, then I can control Judas and his devil, which means though he's against me, he's still under me. See, sometimes, ladies and gentlemen, it ain't about getting rid of your devil, it's putting them in the right place. Reach in here, Tolan Morgan. Y'all missed it. If I, pick, if I picked him, I can control him. And if I picked him, he's in my will. He doesn't have freedom of his own. Even if it is the devil, God knows how to control your devil and put your devil in his will so that he don't have a will of his own. I don't know whose word this is for, ladies and gentlemen, but might I suggest to you today, God will get you to where he wants you to be, even if he got to use the devil to do it. I'm the one that made Pharaoh chase the children of Israel because I'm the one that gave Pharaoh a bad heart. I'm the one that made Saul call David up to play so that his spirit would be healed because I'm the one gave Saul an evil spirit. I'm trying to tell y'all, ladies and gentlemen, I'm the one that allowed Satan to afflict Job because Satan already knew I had a hedge over him. And he had to come to me for permission. Lord have mercy. To be able to afflict Job. Satan does not operate in and of himself. Even he got to submit to the power of God. I picked him so I can control him. Even though he is against me, he's still under me. Can I tell you the next reason why I picked him? I picked him because I needed to show the people that real victory is not in the absence of your enemy. But it's in the presence of your enemy. See, ladies and gentlemen, you can't get victory if you don't want to encounter the opposition. You can't have victory from a distance. You've got to have victory to be able to face the person that is giving the opposition because the victory comes in their presence, not in their absence. Okay, let me prove it to you. Watch this, John Jackson. It's going to bless your life. This context began with a set of people saying, man, we're troubled by your word. We like your miracles, but we're troubled by your word. We're going to leave you. And Jesus turns to the disciples and says, y'all leaving too? None of them left. Isn't it interesting that the folk who should have stayed left 
and the one who should have left stayed. Because if you got a devil and don't like me, why are you still here? This is your opportunity to leave. He wasn't going to leave because I'm using him to get me where I need to be. Y'all ain't going to catch this, but I'll shout myself. Out of all of the 12 disciples, it was Judas who got Jesus to the cross. It was his betrayal that worked together to get Jesus arrested, tried, and to the cross. Y'all don't know how to get happy, so I'll shout myself. What your friends won't accomplish, God will use your enemy to do it. And we know that all things work together for the good of them that love the Lord and are called according to his purpose. I'll take what's bad and still use it to bless your life. Here's the final reason why I picked him. I picked him because I needed to show you that the one who's doing the betraying is the one that's going to lose. Judas betrayed Jesus and then growed a conscience. Returned the 30 pieces of silver and went and hung himself. Jesus that night was hung up on Calvary. Nails in his wrists and in his feet. Crown of thorns on his head. Technically, both of them got hung. But only one of them came back. Ladies and gentlemen, it does not do you any good to try to kill your brother or sister because you're going to kill yourself trying to kill somebody else. And what you plotting, they're going to survive and you're going to die by your own plot. I can't get no help in here. Can I tell you, ladies and gentlemen, revenge is not worth it. Can I tell you, forgiveness means everything so you can live your life and not kill yourself trying to kill somebody else. Because the ditch that you digging for somebody else is really the ditch that you going to fall in yourself. They both got hung, but only one of them got back up from the hanging. Can, can I tell you, ladies and gentlemen, fret not yourself of evildoers, neither be ye envious of workers of iniquity, for every weapon formed against you shall not prosper, but it shall accomplish into the thing where unto God sent it. It's going to work for your good, even when it's somebody who is working against you. Here's the word, ladies, I'm done. Here's the word, man, I'm done. God is not going to remove every devil. Because some devils are on God's payroll. Because some of y'all won't pray as much if you don't have some attack in your life. You come to church for four Sundays straight when you got attack in your life. When things are going good, you know, you'll go every once a month. But 
But I need God in my life because I'm under attack. Yeah, uh -huh, I know. But there are some that God will use and they're going to move you forward because he knows how to make your enemy your footstool. Everyone standing. I understand now why I've been praying for some stuff and it hasn't changed. There's some things in your life that prayer won't change. There's some things in your life that's intended to change you. And the prayer of itself is not going to change things. It's going to change the person praying. Might I suggest to you that in this season of your life, whatever attack you're under could be that you're in close proximity to the next advancement on your life. And don't worry about your enemy because <clears throat> when you're in God's will, they will eventually kill themselves trying to kill you. All you need to do is stay focused. Some of you, the devil is doing overtime because you're so close. You're so close. And I don't know exactly what you're close to. But the enemy understands that whatever that is, if you ever get there, you're going to be great and it's going to be irreversible. <clears throat> so here's what that means. It means that Satan is on a temporary assignment to try to stop a permanent position. But the race is not given to the swift, nor to the strong. But to him that endures until the end. Grab hands with your neighbor. Lord, my brother or sister stands on the precipice of something great. They may not even know what it is. They may not even clearly understand what it is. But Father, I pray that you will allow this word now to penetrate the skin, permeate the heart, set up root in their soul. That come what may, I'm going to wait this thing out. These attacks have something to do with where you want to move us. And we thank you, God, that you don't, even, you, doesn't, you don't just use good to move us forward. You use bad. You can take any element of life and use it and orchestrate it for our good. And we thank you. You got authority over every adversary. You got authority over every enemy. You got authority over every means of opposition. And so God, I pray that the hand we now hold will remain steadfast and unmovable. Always abounding in the work of the Lord. Thank you, God for showing us that we're on the verge of something great. Thank you, God, for showing us that all things are working together for our good. Thank you, God, for giving us victory, not in the absence of our enemy, but in the presence. 
And we give you glory now that you're working all things out for your good and for your glory. In Jesus' name, amen.